I'll take you back a little bit to our history. First of all, uh, uh, you know, recently uh, we've been running now, we have four, four hotels in the group and uh, uh, we've been running Jahannama Palace since uh, 1983. Um, but we were doing an exercise uh, to understand how, uh, you know, how we got into uh, this, you know, how, basically uh, we are descendants of the uh, royal family of Bhopal itself. And, uh, you know, our business earlier used to be horse breeding and, and other things, not hospitality. And suddenly, uh, you know, my father and his brother, they uh, sort of pioneered uh, Palace Hotel in Bhopal. And now 30, 37, 38 years down the line with four hotels, we were just, you know, in the last uh, month or so, just examining how we came to this and how this started because we have no other, this is just the second generation in hospitality. So we went back into time, uh, you know, my uh, uh, father-in-law being, a, uh, he's a singer of course, and, and he's also an avid historian. So we went back into the, uh, you know, the whole Bhopal experience. You can move to the next slide, Sheila. So he went back in time, we, we did a bit of a study and Bhopal's uh, history, I mean, obviously the, the topic is not uh, of, of today's talk, uh, but uh, just to briefly tell you the princely state of Bhopal was founded in about 1723 and through the lineage, uh, there were three Begums of Bhopal as well. Bhopal is famous for having Begum rulers and the last Begums, Second son was the general Baidullah Khan, who was my great grandfather, and the founder of Jahanuma Palace as the built heritage, not as the hotel that we know. Uh, you know, so basically, I'm just going to take some extracts from uh, a certain, ex uh, you know, in in invitee who had visited Bhopal in 1911. Uh, so obviously, uh, back in the day, having, uh, uh, you know. Uh, being from the royal family, there was a lot of emphasis on hosting and there was a lot of emphasis on, on uh, royal pastime. So uh, the general, as he was, uh, you know, known to be, he invited a world traveler, this lady called uh, Laila Wingfield from Delhi. She was visiting India and she was invited to the city of Bhopal and these are her accounts from A Glimpse of an Empire. This is a compilation by Jessica, uh, Jessica Douglas Holmes. But the account of uh, Laila Wingfield of her experience uh, from Bhopal. So these are her words which she described. So I'll just read out some of the comments that she made. So living in a dream for a week was what her description was. Mysteriously conveyed from place to place. Uh, felt exquisite pleasure. Uh, rode in luxury Cadillacs and Ford Model Ts. Uh, enigmatic hosts in Bhopal livery accompanied her while she rode on horseback through royal parks, gardens, and glades, uh, glades of fruits. All my movements seemed like adventures from the Arabian Nights. Uh, so imposing and majestic palaces and Prince Obedullah's wife, uh, a beauty in, in Parda. So basically, a, a host of experiences followed and, uh, you know, Laila spent a week in Bhopal and amongst her several uh, experiences which involved riding and, and, you know, experiencing the royal, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, hospitality of Bhopal. Few uh, experiences which I wanted to bring uh, about is that, you know, which, which till day, uh, nature-based experiences uh, are also doing, uh, you know, so one of our experiences was being uh, driven down to the Bhopal Lake where, uh, you know, very well-clad and, uh, uh, you know, attendants took her by a rowboat to island where the general was waiting and with a 66 horsepower boat, he rode her to another island where there was a lovely tea spread, uh, a high tea with the, with the you know, brilliant spread which she enjoyed and then uh, which, which she enjoy, enjoyed. And then they went for a, you know, a duck shoot, which was obviously something which was happening in India in those days. 
and then finally after that she was invited to a dinner where again she was personally greeted by the general and and uh, another uh, you know representative from the bhopal uh, uh, you know family and was offered a 13 course meal which was uh, you know difficult for her to refuse even though she was quite full from that tea and then finally laila said the hospitality lavished on her made her feel ashamed of the english mode of entertaining and courtesy calling it the magic of the east so i wanted to just bring to light this uh, story because you know indian uh, this is just our story which happened 100 years ago without us running hotel the key aspect of this of this hosting was the experience and uh, what i wanted to highlight is that uh, this is just the story of one small thing from bhopal but indians generally are great hosts and one common aspect of this uh, hosting is the experience and that's why people love to come to india you know whether it is the palaces of rajasthan whether it is the uh, you know nature and and certain cultural experiences of madhya pradesh or down south in kerala indian are very hospitable people and all this hospitality basically has a great experience involved in it whether we make dreams come true or you know uh, the uh, whether it is a fantasy or a, or or, or an enigmatic experience or a transformational experience all this is inherent and in the kind of dna of indians and in this new buzzword of experience based travel we've been doing it for many years it's just we need to kind of organize it in a better way so coming to satpura and coming to the wildlife uh, lodges that uh, that we uh, started uh, you know of course uh, we had a deep rooted affiliation with wildlife generations of uh, Uh, you know obviously uh, the the background that i come from uh, way, way back in the day when it was acceptable uh, people were hunting and in the last two generations you know wildlife viewing has been uh, a passion and it's a deep rooted interest and uh, and uh, it almost seemed a natural progression that we have this deep rooted interest and we are also hoteliers after founding the hotel in 1983 that this could be a great progression to the next step but we chose satpura which was uh, you know not a park which was uh, uh, you know too well known uh, most of the wildlife tourism happening in uh, india was uh, tiger tourism and you know it it actually was something which was not so easy to promote but few of my trips internationally just before we started uh the lodge uh, uh rainy pani jungle lodge, inspired us to actually develop a slightly different model so what we do in satpura we be like to call it wildlife tourism beyond tigers of course a tiger is very much part of it we are in a tiger reserve but it's more than that it's a wilderness uh, experience it's about utilizing the whole landscape and where we got inspired was uh, you know certain trips that i made so while while we conceptualize this whole uh, uh lodge in you know in 2007 8 in satpura we also made a international trip uh, uh, to uh, you know botswana so usually you know in india when we go to africa we always think east africa it's either kenya or maybe tanzania but mostly kenya but we thought you know let's let's try something off the beaten track let's see something uh, which uh, you know most people in india would not have gone at that time now botswana is a major destination for indian but at that time it wasn't so popular so what we experienced there in the okavango delta was that you know the focus is not just on the big five uh, obviously you end up seeing the big five but it's not only on that and you have multiple experiences like the mokoro ride that you saw or you are landing into private game reserves uh, uh, you know on uh, by by air or you are on the zambezi river uh, you know seeing a ma- magical sunset uh you know and experiencing say the victoria falls that you have uh, you can see in this uh, photograph and also the seamless service that they uh, uh, could offer you know i remember when we went there the first time uh, uh, we were, went via south africa and landed in uh, mount and uh, somehow through the transit our luggage didn't arrive so the 
we had used the ambient lodges at that time and, and the representative you know was so calm and composed he said don't worry as long as you have a, a you know change of clothes we'll just fly you to your lodge the sandy bay lodge which is in the okavango delta he said don't worry we'll get your bags and sure enough the next day but they didn't arrange a separate flight for that but there was a hopping flight and our bags came seamlessly to us so that is also adding to the seamless experience you are right in the middle of nowhere you know it's it's quite remote the the to reach the lodge is like a 10 hour drive and that's why you have to uh, you know take a, a, a you know small plane there and here you are with your the airline which is a highly uh, professionalized uh, industry is kind of uh, uh, you know losing your luggage but the lodge is able to provide a seamless service and of course as you saw the previous slide uh, you do uh, see big game as well you have the option of uh, you know angling catch and release and uh, the next slide is actually the, the so we had gone for my mother's 50th uh, birthday and this itself was a big surprise you know uh, uh, on on her birthday which is 26th of april we were going on a regular uh, safari and uh, the plan was something else uh, you know and then suddenly uh, the the driver who's our guide also got got a message uh, you know in uh, and, and and he announced to us that there's a leopard which has made a kill and he took a sudden detour uh, to a place which we, we were not supposed to go and you know he drove quite fast uh, we were expecting this you know big kill and took a like a blind turn and there was a champagne breakfast with uh, you know a lovely sunrise and a perfect uh, setting so what i realized is also that you know and what uh, the the story that i relate uh, narrated 100 years ago what uh, you know my great grandfather did in bhopal and what these guys were doing here that everything was orchestrated you know the experience is there it's a surprise for the guests but it's not a surprise for the people who are doing it so it's absolutely orchestrated well thought out well planned out experiences uh, causing magical moments for for the guests and like a like in a symphony a discerning uh, you know listener can hear a bad note like that a discerning traveler can can see the glitches if it's not orchestrated so that is one uh, very important uh, learning that all this was curated and and orchestrated so that the experience was there was a surprise element but it was actually not at all a surprise for the people who were doing it so again namibia was also this was after we started the launch but gave us a lot of ideas maybe not the best practice here they they are kind of baiting a uh, uh you know a porcupine but it happens there but, uh, but the point is i'm talking about the hide that they use for photography and that also made a really nice experience so a lot of usually most people are interested uh, are used to experiencing day uh, day wildlife experiences but a small little hide within the premises of the lodge uh, kind of allowed us to have a nighttime experience with a porcupine coming the, the next slide you saw is obviously a water hole which is visible from the dining uh, uh, you know uh, dining place of the lodge and you have animals coming so i'm sure a lot of the guests a uh, lot of the participants who visited africa know all this already but the key point is that these are all curated experiences which enhances uh, you know uh, what a guest has to experience uh, over there if you saw the cheetah that is okanjima uh, some of you might have been there these are rehabilitated uh, cheetahs which are actually uh, uh, kind of uh, again they have created a tourism module based on that based on the work they are doing so you must have noticed the collar on the cheetah and uh, they are obviously telling you that that this is a captive cheetah but they tell you the story of what they have done and how they have rehabilitated the cheetah and you can actually walk with these cheetahs so that is something which is unique and interesting the next experience obviously in namibia which was truly exhilarating was also the the tracking of black rhino on foot so there's this in damara land uh, you have these amazing uh, camps one of them is the desert rhino camp run by wilderness safaris and uh, you know 
the whole drama around obviously they're doing great work uh, uh, with conserving the rhino and black rhinos are critically in danger but the whole aspect of them not showing two rhinos uh, on consecutive days they have about i can't really recall how many rhinos they have in that conservancy but they would take turns in showing different rhinos and the team would go out ahead and they would kind of locate the rhino and then the last half kilometer you would kind of track it on foot and that is something which is uh, unique rhinos especially black rhinos do have a uh, you know notorious uh, record of uh, charging at people so the the guides are actually following the wind following the tracks and and actually you become immersed in that whole experience and learning so much out of it uh, uh, you know and me as a naturalist at that time uh, while i was running our lodge in satpura it was such a great learning and experience to actually be a guest and and kind of try and implement some of these things back home so obviously uh, culture and community is a big part and uh, you know the himba community in uh, namibia uh, is very much involved in the tourism process and nowadays most people traveling do like to see how the locals are involved how the locals are benefiting and and they like to be immersed in these sort of uh, experiences so we also uh, i actually don't have a image of uh, uh, our riding experience but we did a riding safari uh, in in namibia and that was one of the best experiences where you know we we track desert elephants uh, on horseback and we were just you know it was my brother and myself who did it and we were just enjoying the ride but the the guide was totally you know uh, in sync with the whole experience and he tracked finally it took us two and a half to three hours to track down the desert elephants but finally we did and and you know all his efforts paid off and there also he was very well aware of the exact behavior you know of the elephants and who the matriarch was and finally we reached up and he went close enough for the matriarch to get a little agitated so that we would have a thrill of cantering away from the you know uh, elephant herd but again what i noticed is that he knew exactly what he was doing it was all curated it was all orchestrated it was obviously a once in a lifetime experience for us but that guide he knew his terrain so well that there there was no surprise for him and that is the key in creating good experiences you have to just like anything we have to rehearse very well i think even creating tourism experiences has to have a lot of uh, rehearsal so that there's no surprise element in the last minute of course the locations in namibia were great and this is something where we have a little bit of uh, uh, you know a back foot because obviously because of the uh law we are not allowed to be inside the reserves but there are still some spectacular locations within uh, our country and some of the wildlife lodges so uh, you know learning from all these things uh, we thought uh, you know both namibia as well as botswana they are brilliant uh, wildlife countries and uh, you know one of the major destination now in africa but at that time uh, they were not heavily visited by indians and they have a slightly alternate sort of uh, model uh, you know when you go to east africa the focus is very much on the big five uh, but here the focus is very much on the experience and you do see the big five but you do do it while uh, having these varied and diverse uh, experiences with nature and i think that that's how we got inspired to uh, create such a model in satpura also because satpura was not the typical tiger park and not the typical park where you were seeing iconic uh, predators but it was a park uh, with brilliant landscape with the satpura mountains running through the park it was the largest park in central india it had uh, big water bodies it had uh, uh, you know great communities living around it so we thought you know it's a great way to experience it in a different way and offer so many different activities whether it's walking canoeing walking with local guides or or jeep safaris and create experiences where where you know even in this sort of location for example if you have breakfast it doesn't matter if you've seen a tiger or a, or a leopard but as soon as you have a coffee here and maybe even hear a alarm call or see a malabar giant squirrel running on the tree canopy while you have a sandwich and a coffee that itself 
becomes an experience, a rare experience, because most people coming to us are from the city, and these sort of things are not possible there. Uh, you know, then the camping. So we couldn't have permanent setups inside, but the camping experience could be done on the edge of the buffer zone and and the the core zone. So uh, this sort of location could be provided in a mobile setting, and that's what we did. And and trust me, these days the highest ticket value we get uh, for our products uh, is the lowest investment, but but the highest in terms of experiential uh, you know offering. So this. Is the, the you know for us is the most expensive experience that we provide, and people pay for it uh, without having any of the creature luxuries. We do have dry fit toilets and and you know a basic tent, but people are paying for hearing the tiger roaring at night. People are paying to hear, maybe have a leopard go behind their uh, you know bush toilet at night, and these are the experiences that 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 people remember. You know, I remember the. The champagne breakfast in Botswana 11 years ago, uh, you know, or, or you know something similar to that. But when you go and have a run of the mill experience, you have thousands of those. You can't remember it after some time. But these these experiences have a lasting effect and impact uh, on on travelers. So of course, uh, just like we experience great guiding in uh, Botswana and and Namibia, we uh, we realize that you know. Uh, naturalists are a big part of the storytelling and bringing the forest alive, and especially in a place like Satpura, where where you're not seeing large mammals all the time. So the naturalist has to talk about the tracks, the signs, build a anticipation of seeing something which you might not see, uh, and if you see, is a bonus. Uh, you know, talking about the flora, uh, talking about the butterflies. And that is the integral part of Satpura. Then we created certain, uh, you know, experiences where we tried to track the attract the iconic five species of Satpura. So when you are spending three or four nights with us, uh, uh, you know, you would be going for a walking safari to find a certain species. You would be going, uh, you know, on a jeep safari to find another species. You would be going on a night safari. So that that builds up a mystery behind each activity. That builds up a uh, you know uh, an anticipation for every activity and an expectation. Sometimes it might be challenging to match meet those expectations, but it builds up that expectation, which then creates that elation once you 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 are able to see. And of course, the bird life uh, is is great. So you keep them engaged. So these are all ways of of course engaging people through. Storytelling and and creating good experiences. Canoe rides, uh, of course, are great to to see the birds as well. And at Rainy Pani, at least we don't have this at Bori, but at Rainy Pani, the having the wildlife in the backyard is uh, very interesting, and it keeps the guest, uh, you know. And this is very much possible in most of the wildlife lodges across uh, the world, where wildlife is coming to the property and that even if you don't see it but you see tracks of it you hear signs of it you live in this fantasy uh, you know where you are you're here for three days and you're in the middle of the whole uh, action so so it, it creates excitement it creates something which is a mystery for for a person which is uh, you know coming away from their uh, you know normal life of course, using architecture, just like uh, most uh, wildlife lodges would do, uh, uh, you know, use local architecture, earthy tones, so that people get a local flavor. And you know, having different uh, dining experiences, uh, uh, you know, in in various locations, keeping a surprise element, whether it's a sundowner like uh, you saw at the camping, or or having uh, dinner under the stars. Uh, you know, or having a dinner with a local uh, person, or having a local cuisine. So everything is is uh, you know planned in such a way that that you have varied experiences first of all and authentic experiences. Then with the advent of Bori Safari Lodge, we thought you know it, it's again something which is not so uh, uh, common to be in the same park. But Satpura on the south side and Satpura on the north side offer totally different uh, wildlife viewing experience. And we thought when we have such a large water body and such a vast park, 
why not make everything i experience including transferring from one lodge to the other so now we offer like a boating safari as well uh, where you can move from one lodge to the other or do a full day safari where you can do uh, move from one lodge to the other so even utilizing the movement from one place to the other itself can become an experience rather than uh, you know maybe time wasted uh, uh, you know and if you are you have better tiger sightings and and there there's chances of seeing uh, other uh, species as well then we also like to just learning from different parts of the world community is a major aspect so engaging with the community of course employing the community uh, that gives them a alternate livelihood and keeps them away from uh, from uh, you know forest related uh, activities you know and this is one of the prerogatives of the forest department also and think community to mass community based activities as well so a lot of people are going now uh, get tourists uh, uh, wanting to experience something which is just beyond the uh, you know very shallow experience but immersing experiencing a local community their food their hospitality their culture and and coming back with you know a transformation in thought coming back in uh, with a with a change perspective of of life and me of uh, obviously as julian introduced me as a naturalist so this is also one part of the experience uh, uh, you know being hosted and guided by me my first uh, wildlife experience in uh, you know ever was actually in satpura and i have a deep rooted affinity with this park dating back to you know when i was maybe 3 or 4 years so that adds to the stories of course we got brilliant naturalists more more knowledgeable than me also on their subject but this just adds to the storytelling of this particular landscape for a uh, you know because of spending little more time here so just showing the experiences uh, what i've had overseas and how we try to implement them in, in satpura by creating experience based travel i think a lot of you already know uh, uh, but there is a transformation uh, in first of all people are more uh, now looking at conscious or responsible luxury early on people would think of luxury as great involving great expense but now it's uh, uh, you know a great state of comfort or elegance with a great experience so basically less is more just like uh, you know uh, the camping experience uh, what we have or, or the champagne breakfast that i experienced uh, 12 years ago in botswana the more natural it is the better it is and and more sustainable it is uh, you know and people now obviously uh, over the 10 years what i have experienced also with indians with western people it was already uh, right from the beginning uh, people wanted uh, these alternate experience even with the domestic audience you know now people are looking rather than you know focusing more on the packages and brick and mortar experiences they want experiences which inspire they want experiences which are more sustainable they want experiences which are more meaningful and uh, uh, you know whether it's related to nature culture community uh, cuisine adventure you know and slow and immersive travel also this is again probably post covid will be one of the important thing to make it more sustainable to make it slower and make it more hands on uh, you know like if there's a if there's a community that, that does pottery in the area so it's a good activity for uh, you know young kids to have uh, you know get their hands dirty and making a small souvenir for themselves to take back so uh, i think quickly i'll just touch upon some of the other international experiences uh, in terms of wildlife uh, and how maybe we could improve ours you know in india so uh, you know i've been lucky to travel to the pantanal uh, which is in fact the almost actually the uh, larger than the size of england it's almost 150 uh, you know 150000 square kilometers uh, the 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 pantanal landscape and 90% of that landscape is actually uh, private but they're still having a thriving uh, tourism model there you see a great amount of wildlife uh, and and uh, 
and here also they have height. So one of the things which we could incorporate uh, in in properties that are uh, you know coming uh, which have which have wildlife coming to them are height. Uh, you know definitely uh, uh, where where the other countries go uh, you know higher than us is basically the the experience which I'll come to later. Uh, some of the points that I've mentioned. Uh, but we also within the country have great models, uh, whether, we, you know, we talk about the snow leopard, which is a lovely community based uh, model, where you actually get immersed in the culture of the people, you stay in their homes, you see the snow leopard. And, and these people used to be herders before, and now they've become homestay owners, and they're actually uh, living off the snow leopard tourism, or the red panda as well. So these are great models which are highly experiential, slightly off the beaten track and, and uh, uh, allowing people to immerse in the culture by staying at people's uh, uh, homes. So that is a very important aspect where the, the, the village people, the, the communities, the, the stakeholder communities actually hosting uh, the guests while they experience nature. So. Uh, so, you know, in India, there's a lot of uh, scope, uh, uh, you know, as you can see the numbers, there's 50 tiger reserves, many national parks, sanctuaries, uh, community reserves. We have a lot of landmass under, uh, you know, forest cover. And India is considered the sixth most biodiverse, uh, you know, country in the world, at least in the top 10. But our sustainability index is right at the bottom and and most of the time you only hear of very popular parks like Ranthambo, Bandavgarh, Kana and, and the popular ones you already know about being the propagators of tourism but we have you know the big seven uh, you know compared to as a country compared to a continent's uh, big five uh, you know we've got this 16 species of cats which is like uh, the most for any country. We've got four species of bears, again the most for, for any country. Rhinos, elephants, buffaloes, you know, great bird species, endemic species. But there's something which is missing in the wildlife uh, model. If, if you talk about Madhya Pradesh, which is perceived as one of the leaders in wildlife tourism, we've got six tiger reserves, uh, you know, many sanctuaries. And there is a good amount of tourism happening here. We are providing alternate incomes to communities, employment opportunities, you know, positive sentiment. Obviously, people are being educated visiting the park. It's providing a vigilance to the parks also. And it's a non-consumptive industry. Actually, tourism, it's the essence of tourism is that if we protect, it thrives. But the model is not designed for conservation because our fee structures are not going back uh, you know to the parks uh, they're going to the government exchequers uh, the tourism anyway is not recognized as something which is for conservation we are only uh, allowing tourism uh, for uh, you know educational purposes and the government is doing conservation on moral grounds as well as for environmental reasons but not for practical reasons or market driven reasons which actually can lead to a self-sustained financial model of, of uh, conservation. And, you know, this is where actually I think uh, we, we fall short on the experience quotient. Uh, definitely there are some brilliant, uh, uh, you know, we have lovely diverse landscape and, and uh, even Madhya Pradesh provides a great experience, but there could be, there is room for improvement, uh, you know, we, we have lions that you see in the west, we have rhinos that you see in the east, uh, and, and you can't deny that uh, there's great wildlife viewing opportunities in India. But there are certain uh, improvements. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, that conservation vision is mostly for moral grounds and for environmental reasons, which are very important. Uh, but we have to also recognize it as a commercial activity where, uh, you know, uh, through tourism activity, we can make more money than is needed for conservation and plow it all back into the system so that destinations, in a sustainable way, so that destinations thrive and the wildlife in it thrive. This 
involve this must involve the community this must involve all all the stakeholders so that there's inclusive benefits uh, you know for uh, all stakeholders and of course there's over regulation in india you know some you know so when we talk about uh, when i talk about over regulation i mean restrictions on say visitation areas we have only 20% of the reserves open for tourism so what happens is that only the people living in that area the local communities uh, the the stakeholders in that 20% area benefit but the 80% of the park is left untouched the people who live in those peripheries do not have access to tourism and they unfortunately are the tribal or the indigenous communities living you know around those uh, you know uh, but that in daily in daily contact with wildlife a lot of interactions turn to conflict and 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 it's not a very pleasant situation so till they don't get uh, alternates uh, you know then it's very difficult for them to save that wildlife and the area restriction also uh, you know uh, has its impact on experience because then you get bottleneck so uh, you know in a park like kana where 145 jeeps are allowed uh, you would only be roaming in those 20% uh, whereas if you have a larger area of the park open you could distribute those jeeps in various areas have a private experience have a exclusive experience allow walks in certain areas allow camping in certain areas you know do cycling in other areas and utilize a larger part of the park on low impact activities enhancing the experience uh, you know and the rules are also quite inflexible in some ways which needs to be improved uh, and we all as a as stakeholders need to you know it's difficult you know the park rules are so strict uh, that you can't even sometimes go use the washroom because you might be one minute late so i have had this experience when i went to uh, one of the parks i don't want to keep naming parks uh, but uh, uh, where i was on a family trip and and my uh, uh, daughter is just 6 years old and uh, you know and in the evening she wanted to use the restroom and we are going past the central area where where you have the toilet but unfortunately the naturalist couldn't uh, stop because he couldn't be late and if he's late he'll be banned so we were basically behind 20 cars making it to the gate and we were all eating dust and there's a 6 year old uh, you know who's absolutely desperate to go to the loo but cannot and and that is a basic thing you know that that just ruins the experience for anyone coming uh, you know some parks you can't you know take a u turn for example on on you have to go 2 kilometers to a junction or 5 kilometers to a junction and then take a u turn so if there's a tiger crossing behind you 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 can't turn around because why because you can't go off road so obviously we are not saying go off road but you can take a few a wheel off road to turn the car but that is also not permitted so these sort of things actually hamper the experience if it's a photographer who's waiting for a lovely shot of a, a, a iconic species that he or she has come to photograph and the naturalist says i can't take a u turn is just not going to understand this he's never going to come back to india and he's going to go back whether if he's an indian photographer he'll move the park or move the state and if it's an international person he'll go back and say you well you can find tigers in india but the rules are so strict that i wouldn't recommend it so these sort of practical issues uh, you know uh, you know make the experience little compromised and we need to definitely look into that and obviously the policy is we are just now subject to ad hoc policy making uh, you know uh, which will definitely uh, will be um, kind of uh, hopefully will be settled but uh, this also makes the experience for visitors uh, you know suddenly you book a uh, experience in october and now suddenly you have to pay double the amount or four times the amount this also makes the experience for tour operators as a trade to work with this uh, to work with wildlife a little challenging not that it's impossible but you know when you need to contract rates and uh, you know you suddenly one month before you suddenly realize that it's four times the price then it's not very easy to make up programs uh, you know and and i already touched upon the rules that have no relevance like these sort of things like you know not able to use the washroom or not able to turn at a certain point so these are 
very very basic things which which are hampering the experience no doubt overall uh, you know we are having uh, there's a change in mindset but these are certain things and i'm sure some of the stakeholders who operate stores or lodges in india might have many other inputs as well so this was just my short uh, presentation on creating experience based travel what we have experienced and uh, you know what i have personally experienced and how i've tried to implement uh, you know it in the lodges that we run and how india why india is lacking a bit when it comes to the experience but by telling the story of our history of our family history the point is that we definitely are natural hosts all indians are natural hosts we are very hospitable hospitable whether you go to a ladakhi person's home and have their butter tea or you go to you know goan person's home in central india they make you sit on their char pai and whatever basic amenities they have they will make you as comfortable as possible so indians are great hosts and the hosting is always accompanied by experience we just have to channelize it in a in a better way and rehearse it in the best possible way so with that i end and uh, uh, i hope i mean this had some input uh, positive input for all of you and i'll be happy to take questions if any